Today, there are so many different views on our human origins, it's confusing. Where some authors and speakers intentionally mix different views and treat them as the same. Our guest today shows that if you ask the right questions, then the answers to who believes what are very clear indeed. Coming up on today's edition of Origins, Who Believes What? with Dr. Marcus Ross. Hello, my friends, and welcome to Origins. My name is Don Chapman, and it's my privilege to be your host. During this program, we showcase interesting guests who present evidence from science, along with other important facts, validating the truth of creation and the accuracy of the Bible. Today's guest is no exception. Dr. Marcus Ross received his Ph.D. in environmental science from the University of Rhode Island, where he researched all sorts of fossils, including a group of marine reptiles known as mosasaurs. In 2005, he started teaching geology, paleontology, and creation at Liberty University in Lynchburg, Virginia. He's greatly interested in the issues surrounding the creation-evolution debate and the intersection of geology with biblical events. Friend, it's so good to have you. Thank you so much. It's now, great I, to be here. I'm thankful for this show because there's so many different groups and subgroups uh, in this whole creation science debate. And... Uh, you're going to talk about who believes what. The purpose here is to clarify these relationships that exist between the origins positions so that you know, the viewers at home can start to understand, oh yeah, this, this is where I sit on this, but you know, my neighbor, Fred, he, he's got a different perspective on this. And I always kind of wondered, but you know, now they get something for them to be able to talk with them about. So to do that, what I also want to do is talk about how some other people in the academic literature have tried to divide out these positions and show them mostly why they haven't worked out particularly well and in the end present a new classification methodology and, and this was something that I was doing for the science people let me show you how to classify things and provide you know the accurate definitions that people need in order to say oh yeah a young earth creationist believes this an intelligent design advocate believes this and a theistic evolutionist believes this and so that anyone who's in those ideas could come up look at that definition and say I can agree to that. I mean, what I want to have here are fair definitions that accurately reflect what people really believe. Let's do it. All right, so I'm going to take a, a walk up over here and take a look at some of these terms. This is a show about creation and science, uh, but creationism can be a very broad term and encompass people who think the earth is young, the earth is old, and have a variety of positions on that. We have intelligent design. Uh, people like Michael Behe, uh, Stephen Meyer are leaders in the intelligent design community. But what is that? How does it relate to creationism? Does it uh, at all? Young earth creationism. I'm a young earth creationist, but what does that, you know, what does that mean? There are old earth creationists as well. How are those different from creationism itself? Um, then you have other terms usually used by evolutionists, such as neo-creationism, um, or uh, some people call themselves evolutionary creationists. I mean, Don, this is a lot of terms. It is. This is a they lot of... certainly have a diversity of meaning. And they do. And because it's a big, wide world out there, and not all people are easily categorized in just one or two sorts of things. So let's take a look at some of the attempts to categorize these by other folks. The first one here was done by Eugenie Scott. Now, Eugenie Scott was the president of the National Center for Science Education. Uh, that was a anti-creation lobbying organization. It still exists. It's out in Berkeley, California. She's since retired. But this was her method to tell people, uh, usually scientists at conventions and meetings or media folks and things like that, this is how she wanted people to understand where the different viewpoints were. Her started off with, believe it or not, flat earthers. Unbelievable. Now, I've never met a flat earther. Have you ever met a flat earther? I certainly haven't. Not in this day and age. I, I, you know, I don't think any of them really exist. Um, but nevertheless, uh, Jeannie Scott said that if you took the Bible really literally, if you were the most literal interpretation you could get, you would be a flat earther. You would believe that uh, God created the world seven days, a few thousand years ago, but you'd also have to believe that the earth was flat. Yeah. Okay. Um, aside from that, 
the next group in were the geocentrists, the people who think that the Earth does not move and that the solar system goes around it. And then you became progressively more and more liberal in your interpretation of the Bible. You became less literal. So literalism goes up this way, less literal comes down this way. So the next group that we come up with are the young Earth creationists. That's the most frequently uh, found uh, group within the United States. It actually makes up about 40 to 45 percent of the American population. 45 percent. 40 to 45 percent. Gallup polls since 1982 have shown that that's about the level that we've been at for the last almost uh, over three decades. Then you have old earth creationists and gap creationism, day age creationism. And, and her method of arranging these is interesting because old earth creationism is a category that actually includes gap and day age and progressive creation as groups within it. Right. So these really shouldn't be, should be coming down. Yeah. These subgroups. should be subsets. Right. Intelligent design, as she puts it, intelligent design creationism, notice she puts the word there, intelligent design advocates don't like the word creationism added in, but she puts it in because they're, in her view, uh, less prone to literal interpretation, even though intelligent design advocates usually say that their view are independent of the Bible at all. And then down here you get evolutionary creationists and theistic evolutionists, people who think that God was using evolution to do the creative activity. And then the bottom, the people who don't take the Bible for anything at all, uh, in her view, the most rational of all the people are the materialist evolutionists. So in her view, you start with crazy at one end and you go towards completely sane at the other and you just have this one line of literal Bible versus non-literal Bible. This isn't terribly helpful. It's not much more helpful than another approach that's very similar put by uh, geologist Donald Wise. He's at the University of uh, Massachusetts at Amherst. And likewise, he's got this sliding scale, but he puts two axes on here. We have one axis for the Bible and one axis for the science. So it almost looks like a real graph. But this isn't data. These aren't real graph stuff. He puts the young earthers at the top, 4004 BC creation, Noah's flood. Then he puts in old earthers with progressive creationists. Uh, underneath them, then uh, kind of theistic evolutionary views in here, um, and then evolution all the way. I mean, <laughs> this was published in a technical science education journal, and you have the phrase evolution all the way. Uh, this was Donald Wise's view, and down here are agnostics, atheists, and secular humanists who believe that there is no deity and the Bible is not accepted as evidence. On the other side of the graph are the, the, the deity can control everything and the Bible is taken literally, so you end up with the young earthers here. So in both cases, you just have this sliding, sliding scale. You're just moving along more Bible, more science. Diana Wise thinks that science and the Bible are incompatible. And, and again, the implication is that those are the really smart people over there. That's right. This is where he is. Yeah. And that's where so all that his friends are. Smart. Yeah. It's smart, right. So what I wanted to do was actually go into the same journal that Donald Wise uh, published this and say, there's got to be a different way to do this. Uh, and, and one of the reasons that the journal ultimately accepted my paper was that they had published this and this could be considered part of the dialogue because there were people such as Eugenie Scott who didn't want my paper published and uh, called for it to actually be retracted after it had been published. And the, and the editors, to their credit, said, no, we won't do any comment and replies on this, but uh, we're going to let it stand uh, where it was. So if we take these two views, we see that there's a couple of difficulties here. The first difficulty is what we call a demarcation problem. Now that's a, a philosophical term, meaning to separate two things, draw a line in the sand. In their view, the Bible and science, this is the demarcation. The Bible's on one side, science is on the other, and there's a clean line that separates what is science versus what is the Bible. They also all use some sort of literal interpretation of the Bible as a classification method, which is interesting because as both secular humanists, they don't have any sort of vested interest in what an interpretation of the Bible is or should be, and really they don't ever define what literal is. So they run into some problems there. And they also assume that there's a uniform theology amongst all of the positions that they have listed. And for some of them, that's certainly not the case. It certainly isn't. The difficulty here is that if the Bible's not science, it cannot guide research, right? Because if science is about research and the Bible is not science, then you can't use the Bible to investigate the world. Well, it also can't you provide you with any sort of hypotheses to test, and it can't be evaluated by science. The Bible becomes this sort of thing that, you know, is your personal faith, and that's all. It can't exist outside uh, of that. But we've got a lot of interesting historical counterexamples to that. Um, Carl von Linné is the one who came up with the biological system of naming animals by genus and species. Right? We are Homo sapiens. Right. Our, our pet dogs are Canis familiaris. 
Linné came up with that system, he believed that the species was the unit of God's creation. And he believed that the genus was kind of a bigger group that included those. Later, he kind of changed his mind. He saw enough evidence that animals could hybridize. He said maybe the genus is the level of God's creation. But Linné thought that the Bible was telling us something about biological classification. He started classification by giving us those Latin names, and we still use it today. Was Linné not a scientist because he was thinking of God creating kinds? I don't know of any biologist who's going to say that Linné was not a biologist, was not a scientist. Uh, Paley wrote, uh, wrote in the 1800s about natural uh, philosophy and the idea that you could use the organisms and the features of those organisms to identify God's handiwork. Whether you agree with Paley or not in the philosophy and history of science, Paley's a scientist. Isaac Newton. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I think we can even just leave that Isaac Newton believed that God created the world and put the heavenly bodies in motion in a particular way and then allowed the rules uh, of uh, physics to govern them once they were already established. Was Newton not a scientist because he got, thought God created the world? Yeah, the, the evolutionist has a real history problem. He does. And uh, even in geology, one of my own favorites is Nico Steno, who was the first geologist to ever interpret a set of rocks and give it a geological history. And he said the rocks around Tuscany, Italy, could be divided into rocks that were formed during creation week, during Noah's flood, and after Noah's flood. Steno started the discipline of stratigraphy, of mapping rock units from one place to another. He's a scientist. So this idea that you can demarcate between the Bible and science simply fails when we look at history. So we also run into the difficulties of this literal criteria. Now, I might say that I take the Bible literally. You might say that. But we also might say, well, I take it literally when it intends to be right. literal. And I take it as poetic when it intends to be poetic. So what does this mean? So the term is subject to a lot of interpretation. And it's usually not the place of an atheist to determine what is a literal and non-literal interpretation of the Bible. Right? If, if they don't think that the Bible is the inspired word of God, then their judgment call on what's literal or not is a little suspect on these sorts of things. Absolutely. So according to Eugenie Scott, the most literal members are flat earthers. Old earth and young earth creationists assume, uh, claim flat earth interpretations might be non-literal. Right? You and I have never met a, a flat earther, but the flat earther might say, um, based on what I see in the book of Revelation, where God says the four angels are, the f are holding the four winds at the four corners of the earth, that means the earth is flat. Now, you're a pastor. You I take am. that as a literal interpretation? Of course not. Why not? It's never intended to be literal. It's in, intended to be uh, a term that just describes uh, all of the earth, the, all of it. Right, yeah. I mean, when you're reading the book of, of Revelation from John, he is being highly non-literal, stylistic, and he tells his audience at the beginning, I've, I'm seeing a vision of heaven. As soon right. as that word vision comes in, you say, you throw literal out the right. door. Right. So let's say that the flat earthers... Um, are, actually exist. They say that this passage in Revelation points to a, a flat earth. You and I might say, you're taking the Bible non-literally because you're ignoring style, you're ignoring context, you're ignoring genre. And as a result, what do we do with the flat earthers? Well, if we've got that system, the flat earthers are being non-literal, we need to move them down because they're not the most literal. <laughs> we need to move, they're past the gap, the day age. We got to put them in here somewhere. Well, if this is where your rational people are, Right? If this is where all the smart people are, and you put the flat earthers right next to them, something's wrong with the system here. Something's this wrong just with the doesn't system. quite work. So literal fails as a criteria. It depends what your agreement on literal is, and there isn't that kind of agreement yeah. here. Um, and it's certainly not for them to, to make that decision. So we have difficulties with uniform theology. Old earth creationists, um, in Eugenie Scott's part, include intelligent design creationism. But within intelligent design creationism, there are young earth creationists. Uh, so that doesn't seem to work. You should put it up over here, right? Well, except for there's also uh, people who think that God used common ancestry and evolution. So some of them belong in here and some of them belong in there. So intelligent design doesn't actually work. Many of the intelligent design people would say that they're not really looking at the Bible. They're just looking at evidence from science. Right. They aren't saying that we're going to define at all what this d intelligence is that designs. We're just saying something right. designed it, right? And, and some of the intelligent design so advocates are not even So there's a real secular dimension to it. Right. right. So, so we've run into more problems here. And right. that's 
That's what we get here. Um, you think that this is a Christian perspective, and there's people in intelligent design who are Jewish, who are agnostic, who are Muslim, yes. who are taking a variety of different positions. It doesn't belong on the Bible. We, we can't put that as an access and actually um, help people understand what's going on. So, you know, what do you do with all this sort of stuff? It, clearly what you have to do is you've got to scrap it. We've got to develop some kind of new method. And right. uh, hopefully we'll be able to do that. Well, we're going to do that uh, I, I, because I've peeked at the notes and it's going to be great. <laughs> but before we do, we have to take a break. Don't you go away. This is very important and also fascinating. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Origins. We're talking with Dr. Marcus Ross, and uh, we're looking at the, uh, the way that uh, we categorize uh, the different positions within the creation movement and, and down into the evolutionists. Um, uh, we've kind of come to agreement that the terms don't mean much unless we define them a little more clearly, so you're going to help us with that. Yeah, you know, and part of it is my training as a paleontologist. I'm used to classification systems. Sure. You know, how do we determine what species belongs to, to this or what fossil belongs to that? And so when I approached this issue, I, I did it with the idea of a classification biologist uh, in mind. And that is that when you go to try and classify something, you never do it on just one character. Um, you know, when you hear the word pachyderm, you think of an elephant. Right. But Pachydermata used to be an order that included the elephants, the hippos, and the rhinos. They were all unified on the basis of one character, thick skin. Yeah. But that's the only thing that they had in common. Right. They were big gray animals and right. that was it. And it turns out that Pachydermata as a group didn't work in the same way that these types of classification systems don't work. We that's need a something, great analogy. We need something that's, that's bigger and that defines things accurately. We have to also avoid these pitfalls that I've just kind of walked our way through. We don't want these science, non-science um, demarcations. We don't want single character divisions. We need more than one character. We need things that are definitional based and something that actually also reflects the fact that some of these positions have positions inside them and others are positions that are separate from the cluster. Separate so we call that a, a nested hierarchy. Mm -hmm. So taking a look at how I wanted to approach this. I approach it the way a biologist would. Let's look at the characters. Let's ask questions and see which position answers yes or no to each of the questions. We ask the question of each position, do you believe that the universe is atelic or telic? And what that means is atelic is no purpose, telic means it was made with a purpose. So does the universe in life have a reason to exist, yes or no? Second, is it detectable or not detectable by science? Can we use science to determine whether or not there's a reason for us to be here? If you say yes, that's one mark. If you say no, that's a different mark. Looking again at another one, we have uh, in this character set the nature of the designer. So if we think that we were made by something, uh, then that designer could be a physical entity, uh, say an alien, uh, or it could be something that's non-physical, like God, um, or something else, right? Uh, maybe you have a pantheistic view where it's God is part of the nature. The spirit of everything. Exactly. Yes. Now, mm -hmm. obviously, a materialist evolutionist who's an atheist is going to say, oh, I don't think that there's any designer involved. So they get scored a different way uh, on these sorts of things. So what we're doing is asking questions and letting each position It answer. defines itself. Exactly. exactly. So if we think that there is a designer, uh, we have to ask the question, does it transcend the universe or is it part of the universe itself? And then uh, we also want to ask about the nature of the designer. Is it theistic or non-theistic? Because you could have a theistic God, you could have a deistic God, right? And you could say... Uh, one you know, who's present or one who's absent. Yeah. That's right. You know, did the God start up the world and then just let it run or has it been an active force throughout the history of its creation and about the history of uh, life over time? We also want to ask some questions about biology, and that is, is biology fundamentally continuous, such as in an evolutionary view, or is it fundamentally discontinuous? Are there separate groups that were created that do not have a physical ancestry to other types of groups? Regarding the age of the Earth, is the Earth old? Do you think that it's about four and a half billion years old, or do you think that the Earth is about 
you know, a few thousands of years old, six, 10,000 years, something like that. So all these ones and zeros and Xs simply mean, did you answer yes, no, or in the case of the Xs here, um, I don't have an answer for that. You know, is the, God, is the God theistic? Well, the materialist says there is no God, so we don't have them coded on that. We run it through a little computer program and we end up with this type of diagram. Fascinating. Now, it looks kind of like an evolutionary tree because the evolutionary trees use the same program to build these things. Okay. But what it's not, really what these trees do, is that each unit down at the bottom of this tells us about the characters that unite the group. It doesn't tell us that they're related in terms of ancestry, it tells them that they're related based on ideas. Mm -hmm. And so, organization to life is the first. Um, if you're a materialistic evolutionist, do you think that life arose through materialistic processes that did not have any designer involved? If you think that there was a designer, the next unit up, everybody going this direction and up this direction believes that design was involved. The big question is, do you believe that that design is detectable, which is the next node up over here, or is that design not detectable by science? So if I'm talking to somebody who's a theistic evolutionist and they say, I believe God created the world, I believe he's responsible for all of it, I believe that Jesus Christ came and died uh, for my sins so that I could uh, join him in his heavenly kingdom, but I don't think that science can tell me how he got, got the whole thing started, he'd be over here in this group. And that would be weak deistic evolution and weak theistic evolution. Now they're not weak because you know, you're, you're puny or something. They, they have a weak view of um, design in that they don't think it can be detected. Stronger views of design are on the axis still, and we find that there are people who think that aliens made the world, not very many of them, but there are people who think that. Uh, people who believe that perhaps the universe is part of God and is an emanation itself of God, and so kind of your pantheistic views, some of your Neoplatonist views. We, it's only up over a couple of areas here where we start to get to theistic views, such as uh, theistic evolution where we think that we could detect uh, that God was involved. So Michael Behe, as an intelligent design advocate, thinks that God created using common ancestry and evolution, but he thinks that God was specifically making things along the way. So he belongs up over here where most theistic evolutionists are on the other side of the graph. I'm a young earth creationist, I'm way out over here next to the old earth creationist because both of our groups agree about more items uh, than anything else. We think that um, there's real design in the universe, that we can detect that, we can use science to do it. The designer is not part of the universe itself. It's theistic, and uh, that biological world was separately created according to kinds and groups. So I have a lot more in common with an old earth creationist than I do with any of the others because we share more ideas in common. And this helps to better reflect these ideas. Another way that one could look at it is these little you know, nested bins. Again, the young earth and old earth creationist are together closest, even though they disagree on the age of the earth, they agree that God created according to common. They have a lot more in common than they have apart, don't Way they? more in common. Yeah. And that should teach us something in Christian unity as well, that okay. we can disagree we about some things. be afraid to learn from each other. That's right. And yeah. we have things that we can learn from some of the ID folks, and we even Certainly have some do. things that we can learn from outside of our perspectives on these. But it tells us that there's a, you know, a range here and that some of our groups are more in common to one another, not just because we're more literal on the Bible. That's a mistake. Uh, to look at it that way. It's because we agree on more particular premises. So intelligent design is a position that recognizes that you can de detect design uh, in the universe. That's something that they believe. And that's the only thing that you have to be to be part of the ID community. So the ID community includes a lot of different perspectives in it who all agree that you can use design to, uh, to identify things. Young Earth creationism, the definition here is much bigger, but that's because it's more specific. Yeah, Intelligent design is not very specific. Young Earth creationism is because we've got detectable design, we've got a transcendent theistic God, discontinuous biology, and an age. Those are a lot more things than intelligent design uh, is able to, uh, to affirm because they're a bigger tent. So ID and young Earth creationism and all these different views are different concepts with limited but important points of agreement uh, with one another. We can determine detectability and design. So, you know, what we can get out of this is that something like intelligent design, if you're reading from an ID person, they're theologically and philosophically very minimalistic. You don't have to agree to a lot to be part of the ID community. Young Earth creationism, as well as Old Earth and theistic evolution, much more specific in, the, in what they affirm. And so with that, I, I, I certainly have a lot of thanks to give out to some of the people who helped read over and 
give me some comments and critique. And you know, interestingly, we've got two people, Andre Ariu and David Fostovsky, who were um, at University of Rhode Island when I was a grad student, and they're both materialist ev uh, evolutionists. Paul Nelson and Kurt Wise, both young earth creationists, but Paul Nelson works with the intelligent design community, and Kurt Wise is much more aggressive on the young earth perspective. So it's from learning with friends and colleagues like this that uh, something like this you know, can help the broader community understand when you talk to your neighbor, when you talk to your friends, when you talk to a kid at school, who does believe what and why? That's a great thing you've done. Thank and you. uh, I can see how you took your training from one area and used it in this area to be a help to all of us. My friends, I hope it's helped you too. And uh, I want you to always be sure that you're listening to people even that you don't agree with. A lot of times you'll learn from them. That doesn't mean you give up your principles. It doesn't mean that you surrender truth. But learning is a wonderful thing. And learning to, to, put, to know that every word you use has meaning and to learn to appreciate people who don't agree with you, all of that's things that Jesus majored in that he would have us major in. Never forget, though, it's God's view he created you. And that should be your worldview, too. Hope to see you again soon here on Origins. And until then, God bless you, my friend. Thank you for watching this edition of Origins. For a DVD of this series, you can order online or send a $12 donation to cover shipping and handling and write to Origins Program number 1613, Cornerstone Network, Wall, Pennsylvania, 15148. If you like a copy of the PowerPoint information presented today, you can download an episode guide at OriginsTV.org. Origins is made possible by the faithful prayers and financial support of you, our Cornerstone family.